I am Heather Bendari, adjunct lecturer in visual art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth artist lecture in the visual art department this year, and the first one of 2021. I'm very excited to start the year with the amazing artist Fierle Baez, who will be in conversation with Leticia Alvarado. This is a different format than our usual artist lectures, and we're really excited to have them both here together today. Before I introduce Letty, who will then introduce Fearlay and contextualize her work, I want to acknowledge that I am situated in Brooklyn, which is the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape, and that the List Art Center, where our department is located, sits on the occupied indigenous lands of the Narragansett and Wampanoag people. If you don't know the history of the land you occupy, you can look to native-land.ca to begin your research. I also wanted to highlight that we are connected by a campus that relied on the African slave trade in the Americas and that there are buildings on campus constructed by enslaved people. These acknowledgements commit us to a lifetime of anti-racist work. I'd like to thank Leslie Bostrom, the chair of the visual arts department, Winnie Geyer, who is behind the scenes organizing and also designing all the amazing, amazing visuals that come out of the department. Christine Dodd, Alanda Estrada, Sean Tavares, Gregory Picard, and the Brown Arts Initiative for making this work and this series possible. Without all of them, we would not be sharing this digital space. Though we cannot see you, um, we know you're here and we welcome you. So hello and thank you to the, I think, nearly 100 people out there sharing this time together. A few more things to note before we begin. We kindly ask that you refrain from recording this event yourself. A recording of the conversation will be available through the Brown Visual Arts Department soon. If you would like to take screenshots, please tag at Brown Visual Art and at Fearle Baez. Also, after the presentations and conversation, there will be time for Q&A. Please type questions into the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen whenever you, have, whenever you have those questions, and Leticia will ask the questions on your behalf. Be kind and curious and ask lots of questions. All right, now we can begin. We are lucky to have Leticia Alvarado here with us today. She is an Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies and American Studies at Brown University. This is an exciting moment for us to collaborate between departments. Um, she's the author of Abject Performances, Aesthetic Strategies and Latino Cultural Production, published by Duke University Press in 2018. And her essays and articles appear in numerous academic journals. For example, the award-winning museum catalog, Axis Mundo, Queer Networks in Chicano, LA, and the forthcoming books, uh, Keywords for Gender and Sexuality Studies, and also the Art Institute of Chicago Field Guide to Photography and Media. Her current book project, Cut, Hoard, Suture, Aesthetics in Relation, is supported by Creative Capital, Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant Program. So please um, help me in welcoming Letty. Hello, um, thank you all for sharing your evening with us. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. I'm thrilled um, to be here and in conversation with Theda Lay Bias today. I wanna first thank the Department of Visual Art uh, and the Brown Arts Initiative for their support, both financial and administrative to make this event happen today. When thinking about how I might set up our conversation, the figure of the Siguapa, and let me um, pull up my images here to illustrate. Uh, the figure of the Siguapa from Dominican folklore, recognizable by her abundant hair and backwards pointing feet, emerged as a useful guide. This same figure drew me to Bias's work years ago and adorns the promotional material uh, for today. The alluring, not quite human form leads us into many of the topics I hope to center in our conversation including the ways Baez uses historical sources, both popular and official, her revelatory explorations of race and diaspora, and her investigations of knowledge production, its institutions and experts. I am particularly drawn by the Siguapa's agility with what I read as institutional critique, despite or perhaps because of the institutional embrace of her artists and the difficulty of critique within this embrace. Baez is, after all, an artist of tremendous and well-deserved renown. Here's where I share a quick sample of her professional accomplishments. Baez received her MFA from Hunter College after a BFA from the Cooper Union. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Herb Alpert Award in the Arts, the Soros Art Fellowship, 
the College Art Association Artist Award for Distinguished Body of Work, and was recently shortlisted for the prestigious International 2020 IFIS Moonbi 9 Award. Baez's work will be the subject of a solo presentation at the ICA Watershed this summer, and has been the subject of solo exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art, the DePaul Museum, uh, the DePaul Art Museum, Taller Puerto Riqueño, the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art, the Pettis Art Museum Miami, and the Andy Warhol Museum. Her work has also been included in a number of important group exhibitions and is held in the permanent collection of many museums, galleries, and private collections. Thinking about this enthusiastic art world embrace, I want to turn to Bias's work as a warm up to our conversation. In Can I Pass Introducing the Paper Bag Test to the Fan Test for the month of June, Bias lays out a grid of quick study self-portraits in which colorism tests meet. To the paper bag test of the US South, she introduces the fan test of the Dominican Republic. Bringing together 30 individual panels arranged to resemble a wall-sized calendar, whitewashed backgrounds offset detailed articulations of the artist's opaque bust and silhouette. The detailed outlines are filled with broad and quick brush strokes of paint mixed daily over the span of the project to match the artist's forearm as among other things, a formal exercise meant as quote, a warm up in the studio. Each study prominently features a detailed set of eyes by and large gazing out rendered with realistic accuracy. In this work, flesh and hair are scrutinized by the inferred artist posing in front of a mirror, as well as by the work's audience for the supposed biological facts of blackness, the dermal tech structuring of social hierarchy in one and the weight of hair texture determining status in the other. In these daily studies, Bias set out to try to understand compulsory, compulsory racial identification. If I have to lock myself down into something, she tells us of the question undergirding the study. If I have to see myself through a specific filter, as many people of color are forced to in the US, what would it be like? Can I pass stages the clashing of racializing hails as those that organize race thinking in the United States encounter those of the Dominican Republic that travel with its diaspora? But the structuring grid in Can I Pass is also informed by distinct racial ontologies from those forged through the black white binary cemented in US imaginaries. There is a long tradition of disguise bias has shared, quote, for people of color within the totalitarian narrative of identity in the US. Because we Afro-Caribbean artists come from places without fixed identities, we are often able to make connections to all kinds of different things and see ourselves as being part of a larger global diaspora. In Can I Pass, Bias literalizes the racial structuring logics that will frame the reception of her practice within US-based structure, within US-based markets. The conditioning required to endure an engagement of these logics but also the possibility of imagining otherwise while addressing hegemonic racializing schemas. Indeed of this work, Bias has said, in that series, I retained the gaze out of a need for personal agency to act as a counterbalance to the inherent psychic violence of those two tests. The detailed set of eyes anchoring each frame of the race test grid then might be read as delivering an angential resistant gaze in disguise knowledgeable of alternate racial formations, warm-ups to the durational practice of sustained engagement in the art world. These daily portraits directed Bias's facility with color and skill in drafting toward a practice navigating the entwinement of race, production, and circulation and their imbrication within hierarchies and institutions that structure racial capitalism. In Bias's rendering, I'm also, I also read an indication of her Siguapa aesthetic. In her longstanding Siguapa series, as well as across her oeuvre, the Siguapa appears in larger than life canvas, canvases, minuscule and multi-part installation vignettes, and most recently a mosaic composite transforming a subway platform in New York City's Dominican stronghold, Washington Heights. Often rendered 
as a color saturated amalgam of flora and fauna. She is the product of the artist's embrace of the usually maligned Lilith like wild woman from the forest as she describes her, who filled the stories of her childhood warnings to avoid too much wildness, nature and independence. A fixture of Dominican discourse through whom national racial identity is imagined and gendered comportment in reproductive functions conveyed as activated by bias, the Siguapa, um, the Siguapa facilitates an exploration of colonial race making technologies and Afro diasporic relationality with femme animality countering civilizing or domesticating projects. She also deploys the Siguapa in institutional critique of archives, libraries, museums, and galleries, the very actors that sustain the preservation, exhibition, and circulation of art, as well as knowledge production more broadly. To do so, bias ties these institutions to colonial enterprises for ordering, quote, new worlds, taking on, for example, Carl Linnaeus, father of modern taxonomy. In Siguapa Habilists after Carl Linnaeus, bias represents an affront to systems of naming through which the world is hierarchized, using Linnaeus's system of naming of binomial nomenclature to categorize the Siguapa in relation to the institutionally construed human. Ultimately critiquing the construction of that very episteme established by what bias refers to as the horrible violence these systems wrought on flora and fauna unknown to Europe in the systems that enforce this differentiation. In her title, Bias mimics the habit of naming through relation, claims connection to the earliest known organisms with whom we share genus for her Siguapa, Homo habilis, but also creates a taxonomic split, one that allows us to imagine her as linked to other organisms who, like her, defy the knowable direction of their movement. In defying the organizational system through which the wilds become ordered, arrayed, studied, and hierarchized, bias presents modes of being before, concurrent to, and beyond our current moment. This critique and promise is carried by her Siwapa's gestural movement as in man without a country, aka anthropophagist waiting in the Artibonite River. In this work, Organisms connected by their movement across a composite of small vignettes spanning a gallery wall parallel the movement called out in the title's invocation of a body of water that runs the span of the island of Hispaniola from the Dominican Republic to Haiti, and in whose waters femme figures wade. The appearance of maps beyond the geography of Hispaniola in the work, maps of the continental US, for example, convey a broader traversing awaiting against colonized landscapes. A work created by marking pages of the accession books from the Cooper Union's library, throughout the vignette in Man Without a Country, Bias additionally counters historical amnesia with cannibalistic threat in palimpsest, layered atop official if now out of favor discourse. Wading across pages, bias described as marked by the patina of age and content she describes as now recognized as morally wrong, but once in keeping with Cooper Union's goal of quote, indoctrinating young immigrant men, men into American industry through science and architecture. The anthropophagist of the title here, the cannibal, denies the adventuring man a country to know, consume and occupy. Speaking directly to the linkage between projects of science and architecture, but also the training of artists under shared ideology, the Siguapa unfurls aesthetic gestures from within one episteme toward the unsettling of institutional stability. A cannibal who has littered the composite vignettes with severed limbs, the Siguapa activates the land we know her to embody as itself an anti-imperial force. Bias here offers us an aesthetic gesture as a heuristic approach that counters the boundedness of exhibitionary spaces, but is cognizant of institutional flows one might activate as and through the Siguapa. Bias's Siguapa offers us an urgent reminder of connectivity as environmental desecration makes unavo unavoidably clear a shared fate for organisms across the globe a shared if varied experience of violence, of the violence of racial capitalism. 
She also pushes us to consider knowledge systems erected through empire, whose organization of the present is ensconced in our most respected institutions. Bias issues strong critiques of power, of archives and history, museums, and the broader cultural industry as instantiations of larger ideological dynamics. Still, she allows us to imagine, often from these same locations, the limbs under us that might take us to an untraceable place, agile roots moving across a vacuous unknown to an elsewhere, another way to do things. I am thrilled now to hear more from the artist herself about her work. Thank you. Just waiting for Fida Lay to pop on. Hello, everyone. Fidele here. I will start sharing my screen with you. Let's see. So I would like to start off by thanking the incredible people who have um, made space for this conversation to begin with. Um, First, starting with Leti, who has this incredible encyclopedic writing that is so generous and that um, synthesizes all the things that just run through my head and I have been trying to uh, express through my work and she gets it. And it's thrilling to know that someone can see so clearly to it. Um, I would like to also thank Heather and Leslie and Christine and Winnie um, for again, creating space and allowing this um, to happen, the sharing of ideas with all of you guys. Thank you also for taking time on this very cold day. I know in New York, we're kind of moored in by snow. Um, so thank you again. Um, one quick second. So as you can see from my work, I um, will be repeating some of the images that Letty showed and expanding on what I hope my work uh, does. Um, I first started off as a visual artist or as a child. Um, the first time I thought of myself as an artist was as a child trying to anchor myself in space. Um, I moved around a lot, um, sometimes several times during the same year. I went to a different school for every school year from kindergarten to high school. And one way that allowed me um, to kind of anchor or, or create a sense of comfort within all these different spaces was for me to adapt the environment I was in. Whatever was my room became this world where I can imagine not just my present reality, but um, you know, juicy futures or pasts that I would like to be uh, carried by or um, carried into. So um, that is still part of my work, as you see in these environments. It's now um, a way of engaging with different passed down concrete histories, uh, different myths, as, which for me um, are also ways of uh, seeing the world or of, of uh, accessing what might not have been written down in historic texts and um, contemporary uh, future making. So looking at a lot of Afrofuturism, for instance, and looking at projects like this site here, Sans Souci in Northern Haiti, um, which for me is an anchor point for so much of what we consider to be the Americas, what we consider to be the United States, and other thought projects like the Enlightenment, or modernity in general, or um, modern economies and commerce. So what I have done is articulate that space in a way like what Saidia Hartman does, not out of um, the archives that are written down, but almost trying to look at uh, the absences within it to fully flesh out um, a more generous and um, true history of um, how someone like me came to be in the world how my family, the people I love, um, interact with the world around them. So uh, one way that outside of that uh, 
reality building. And it's funny because now that we're in this space of um, having to parse out what is true or what is not true or active fiction making by um, false narratives in the internet or our interaction in media, um, it's funny because this practice allowed me to equip myself to question information passed down to me. So in the same way that we have to actively arm ourselves against um, destructive narratives, um, this was me in a post-fact world, in a pre-post-fact world, trying to parse out what were the fictions that were passed down to me as fact and um, expanding on them, acknowledging them and expanding to encompass uh, more granular truth. Um, as a painter, I get to do that. All the things that I used to really feel uncomfortable with painting, it has this strong tradition of um, myth-making, of uh, especially in the West, of um, concretizing fictions that can be sometimes harmful for the people not depicted in it. I will actually replay it again while I speak. I think I have a few minutes. Um, so representations of the body and beauty within the Western canon um, were always uh, taken as fact. And I get to use that same tool to recalibrate and to um, include people like me in it and to be able to look back. Um, so I'm really grateful to be part of this conversation with you guys and hopefully um, have a generative conversation on uh, what parts uh, are working and not and um, what you guys in the audience um, feel like is your, how you're part of, how, what is your part in this project of um, us collectively creating the world we want to live in um, through every gesture down to the things we make and um, our intent and how we interact with others. So I will stop sharing. Thank you all and um, start a conversation with Leti. I know it might have been a bit short. Hi Leti. <laughs> Do you want to share your screen or would you like my presentation to keep looping? I haven't figured out how to make it loop. Um, we, can, we can have your screen on. Can you guys see me? I can't access the chat when I'm in screen sharing mode. So it might have to be up to you, Leti. Um, something. Hi. Oh, yeah. Hi. There. So sorry about that. Something happened um, and we couldn't see me. I think we still have Fidele's um, screen sharing, uh, but there she is. Okay. There we go. Okay. So thank you so much for that. Um, it was really great um, to see all those stunning images um, and also so fun to be in your studio and see some, some of the ways that you work um, or the environment in which you work um, right behind us. So um, I'm really psyched for this part of our, of our event today. Um, and I wanted to start, um, you know, one of the things I most admire, in, admire about your work is the evidence of a tremendous amount of research. Um, right, even, even just now dropping the Sadia Hartman, right, it's clear you spend time in the archives, it's clear, clear you spend time in libraries, and so I wondered if you might share with us a little bit about your research process when you're developing a piece or a series of works. So, um, it's funny because I, I, I'm intimidated by archives, um, but it's almost like, um, you know, because of that intimidation, there's also an effort to run wild in it and to <laughs> find out why I'm so uncomfortable. I love um, how it's almost like a hallowed space when you enter a really beautifully designed library. Um, but my research a lot of times is involves mining online archives. So even something like JSTOR or ArtStore and 
allowing this non-hierarchical um, access to information. So giving a meme, starting from a meme and breaking it down to um, its sources. Uh, what someone like Kerry James Marshall would um, label Afrofuturism, he, when you look at the beauty shop, for instance, his painting of a beauty shop, it is so symbolically loaded. But formally, you can just find this moment of reveling and like in grooming and self-care. But um, then you have, you know, commentary on early Renaissance depictions of space, um, the barbious construction of beauty, of um, different gatekeeping within all those realms, and then still asserting a vision of what you would, yeah, yeah, what he considers beautiful and, and concrete, yeah. And I love the span of your archives too, right? Like you're pulling from popular culture, right? Academic sources, um, kind of official national archives as well, giving us a really um, broad range. It's so funny um, that you say that you're intimidated by archives because one of the, I think the effects of the deep research that comes across in your work um, is the way that you are tying different institutions together. At least for me, that's one of the things that comes across most um, loudly, um, right? Science and knowledge, um, the art world, um, colonialism, empire, right? All of these things are tied together. Um, and, and you're speaking directly back to all of them in what I think is quite a brave way. So uh, for someone that's trepidatious of the archive, you're certainly wielding it very powerfully. Um, Only so because I'm a visual artist. I think that's one of the main reasons why I, I didn't stick to academia because I felt like um, there is, you need to be even braver to do that within the strictures of the academy. Um, you have to cite and like reference, cross check everything and say, I am working within this form and you'd, you're, if you're doing anthropology, you work through anthropology. So I didn't even know that something like Saidia's work was possible and I could only do it through visual artwork. Um, but the world is like fully open now. <laughs> she was able to crack that code. Totally, yeah. But, but can you tell us a little bit more though about how, you, how you're tying in all these institutions? Because I think you know, you're doing a kind of citation yourself, right? Um, in, in the layering, um, in your, your visual iconography and your referencing. So um, maybe could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I think with, with my work, I can, sorry if you guys hear that it's like an active studio building. So we and might I hear can pull some. Up, I can pull up any images you want to. Um, so let me see, even something like um, the installations, um, the interior or the outdoor sculptures, um, it's an effort towards um, not prioritizing one narrative to really opening in a way that is, um, it's like having one point perspective and experiencing the world in 5D. Um, you experience not just what you feel physically, but the things that uh, are thought and um, emotionally felt. Um, you're trying to, re in, in reducing to one single narrative, you reduce the, capaci the capacity of, of, of how we actually navigate um, the world in, in fact. Um, and then realizing that even within that expansiveness, we, all, we still have limitations. So what more could we be or see if um, we took those filters off? And I, I believe that as an artist, um, as a painter in particular, where paintings function almost like Rorschachs, they're a place for projection a lot of time. Um, you, the viewer, can come in with what you already know. And through that process of projection, uh, allow more information to come in at an unconscious level and then actively. So it's this, this multi-layered way of experiencing the archive that um, gives room, if you're generous enough, to um, see more or to, to, to be um, more expansive. Yeah. And also your response to the archive then is also multi-sensorial, right? The, the, and for, for me, there's also, you know, now you're making installations as well, but something about the Siwapa, the hair for me is so 
um, even if you're painting it, it's just so um, rich and um, and tactile, right? And actually, um, I, I'm looking at the Q and A, and I'm going to pull in one of the questions now, just because I think it it really relates to something that you're saying. Um, Lily Mangesha first thanks you for everything and, and says, I saw an image that had a figure holding a text from Octavia Butler, um, who was also a person invested in myth making and building different futures, particularly through dreaming. Is dreaming partic a particular practice for you? If so, how do, you, do dreams direct you, right? It, I, I feel like it's um, could be linked a little bit to the Rorschach that you're talking about. Um, yeah, or, we can or actually kind of go imagine. into that image because that actually sure. collapses different access to different um, archives. That was used as an image for this um, campaign by the Public Art Fund this summer um, that in invited 50 artists to um, create a work. So if you go to the image right before that, you can see how it was a public image. It was kind of memorying. And then if we move forward to the next one, she's looking directly at you in a way that if you're looking at all the detail around her, um, you might not necessarily first notice. And she's reading Earthseed, one of the books of the Earthseed series by Octavia Butler. Um, so the figure itself was an amalgamation of um, civil rights activists in a moment of rest. Um, it's an archival image of these women very beautifully dressed, sleeping in church pews um, between the Selma March. Um, and they, they're, you know, this intergenerational image of women um, just holding and caring for each other in between like a battle, for instance, like if, uh, between facing like, you know, harsh, a harsh exterior, external world. Um, so this is an echo, like that moment of truth of, of a historic artifact is a mirror of what was um, of Octavia Butler's story of Earthseed. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's this beautiful book that is almost a bit too prescient. It, um, all the environmental and political and um, gendered, all these things that we, uh, collapses and worlds that are built that we're facing now are very concretely narrated in that series. Um, and that particular book she's reading, it ends with um, this band of um, people seeking refuge from this world in chaos, um, taking a moment of rest in between before they face yet another um, challenge. Um, and I made that painting during the beginning of COVID, um, not being, not knowing like how, how to even address something like that. How um, someone like me, who's like always working, who is, um, making work in this larger scale that very actively engages my body. So things that I can't do little things too quickly. I have to like, if I do one small book page, it's making a hundred so that I can almost like get that energy out. Um, and this painting because of that um, was almost very contained and, and very detailed. It's as um, dense as I allow myself to make it. If we go back, you can kind of see um, and I, let's go back one more. The, I hardly ever show a very um, direct body. And even though mm -hmm. it looks very abstract here, for me, this is way too representational. Um, so it, it was almost like indulgent for me to um, give that much in a painting. Um, but it's still, you know, there's, there's this levels of, um, Protection disguise. Yes, yeah, yeah. disguise. So thinking yeah. of disguise almost, yeah, as armor and protection. Yeah. And I, I love too, though, your use of the organic to do that. So one of the, you know, I'm, I'm hearing layers of care work with dream work, um, but also um, your engagement with Afrofuturism. Um, and, and what I love about your engagement with Afrofuturism is that it doesn't look or feel um, ways that we've become accustomed to thinking about it, right? We don't see as much of the mechanic um, of the automatic, right? We see instead the organic, we see, um, but, but we do see you thinking through, for example, technologies of race making, right? Or um, the, the science and technology of ordering the world and thinking about time 
um, in a really, um, I think, Afro-diasporic kind of way. Yeah, so even, even in that sense, like um, Octavia Butler has that beautiful series of Xenogenesis, where it's not a Star Trek steel angled idea of futurity. It's not like this um, kind of very limited 60s view of technology. Um, it's rhizomatic, it, um, it is organic. So the, it's this um, post-apocalyptic post earth, this er alien race comes and the only way to save the hu a humanity is by um, merging with other beings. So creating something new out of, and it's funny because she was talking about um, binary, gender binaries and um, uh, like in such nuanced way. So in order to create a human being, you needed five beings. Um, you needed a two, uh, a male and female human pair and a male and female alien and then a, a non-binary figure to really create life. Um, so in these really sophisticated alien spaces, there was never any shiny steel edge. It was always something that grew and um, adapted to the body. I love it. Is this, is this, are you thinking about that formation when you Yeah, that's sort of like a Siguapa Oloi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so these like uh, different, um, different appendages, even the very first image, um, that, that image actually came to me um, in the very beginning of it. It's these two figures hugging in an embrace with their kind of like upper bodies intertwining. Um, that I'm image to actually there. came to me in the subway. <laughs> and um, just thinking of, of how um, we express care and how we um, consider the environment and what um, the things that we think separate us are actually the things that uh, are actually an interface yeah. um, for us in the world. Um, yeah. And hanging from it are these little asabaches. So having that strange fruit be, again, this thing of protection for every newborn. I love it. And then also, right, when you flip the asabache, it's a, it's a black the power. The power fist, yes. Right. And um, I, it's, I was really thrilled when uh, Kara Walker had her sugar baby. And mm -hmm. one is a black power fist and one is asabache. I was like, yes. Connecting the full diaspora. <laughs> yes, I love the connectivity of iconography across your work. Um, I am noticing a difference in the way that you're rendering here. Um, and, and maybe that um, can lead to my next question. You know, in, in our communication over the last three years, trying to get this event together, yeah. I've noticed you're incredibly busy. Um, I know some of it is top secret, but can you share a little bit with us about what you're working on now? Um, how your work is developing, departing um, from your earlier work, or, or maybe continuing some of the threads? Um, I think it's always, a, in my mind, a continuation. As an outside viewer, you might say, where is this coming from? But it's uh, almost like a condensing of what I'm trying to say. So a lot of times, these Iwapas feel like in that moment of transformation, uh, as if the, you're, you're seeing a metamorphosis in process. Um, and some of these newer paintings are um, seeing if I can express that without the body or um, energetically. So if you even look at something like Temple of Time, which is this almost like explosion of um, from the center, it's, let's see, if we could go, where would that one be? I remember that one, there you go. So um, this would be, for me, a continuation of something like that or um, Jeu de Monde, that Seguaba figure you use in the advertisement, that one and the other one are a direct correlation of the same energy, energetic hmm. work. Um, but um, formally, you wouldn't see that. Um, even the layering and um, of paint and um, engagement with different aspects of the archival image I'm referencing. Um, so there is this one painting I'm very excited about for Artist Mundi, which will open in next month, I believe. And um, I've always engaged with images of things like Mardi Gras or Carnival in the Caribbean um, and thinking of the acrobatic gestures that um, 
we in diaspora have to make to engage with both culture and language um, to make sense of worlds that seem to be in opposition to each other. Um, so it's like an acknowledgement of that, of, of how do we, as someone, um, so for instance, given, to give an example, the objections to someone like Juno Diaz, uh, is writing in the Dominican Republic, how um, for Latinx folks like myself who exist um, in this point where we're never like fully Americana or fully of that place we came from, we're in this transversal space where we can see both fully because we're never fully within it. Um, seeing how to even talk to someone who considers themselves solely of that one space. Um, so Juno Diaz is thinking that he's writing an authentic Dominican um, story. And someone from the island would say, you exist within, you're, you're um, almost like the dregs of ourself. You're, you're not a pure essence of who we want to be seen and be. Um, so, and to begin with, your writing is in English. You're not even writing in Spanish. But then his response to that being like, Spanish itself is a colonizing language. What is an authentic voice? If we as people have to master these tools that didn't take us into consideration to begin with. Um, so someone like myself who really has um, mastered or, or been fully involved in a Western canon and um, loves painting, how um, do I work within that in a way that gives nuance to who I am? Because that is part of my existence in between these two worlds. Um, like we cannot have a fully Taino text. We cannot have, we had many diasporas from the African continent and many diasporas from the European continent. Like how does that negate our narratives? And instead being, you know, seeing how um, in our, in our nuance, we can give a more uh, fuller vision of this in between space or both spaces. I think this is what I love so much about your rendering of the Siwapa, right? That it's, its origins in the late 1800s was actually one about nationalist mestizaje that is almost um, uh, in denial or working within a kind of anti-Black framework. And for you, it's one of Afro-diasporic relationality, right? And um, one of the things that I love from your Blood Life exhibition um, was the engagement with specifically the, the border, right? Um, thinking about all of Hispaniola and also thinking actively about um, Haiti and bringing that into conversations, a kind of vital conversation of, of kind of Latinx studies or Latinx identity um, that also, that challenges in the way that you're talking about Juno Diaz, right? The, the kind of conversation of who can be included and how they can be included. Um, and this, the Siguapa does all that work for me, which is, you know, why I'm so obsessed with it. I know there's other things in your work, but this is why um, I'm so obsessed with that one figure. So we have, um, um, I'm going to ask uh, one last question, then a couple of short fun ones before we pop out um, to the Q&A. We have a couple of questions building. Um, so bearing in mind the makers in our audience, our visual arts concentrators, but perhaps also those students de dedicated to knowledge production, our doctoral students or master students, um, what is the one piece of advice you might offer at this stage of their careers? I would say to um, fight the single narrative or to be constantly aware of, um, of singular narratives and to be generous and open to them. And even when that plentitude can seem like something that'll unmoor you or um, disorient you, be open to that and, and, and be in flow with it, I guess, um, so that you can, um, find grit and nuance. Some of, uh, I think you're gonna ask me this later, but some of the, my favorite artists are the ones who um, are able to constantly live within that curiosity um, and to just have that durational look in whatever they do. Yeah, I love that, I love that. And, and we see it 
um, in the ways that you've described your process, right? Multiple little paintings, lots of, we see it in the background, all the different things happening. Um, and I, I appreciate it so much in the, the message that comes so strongly across your work. One right? last thing. Yes. That your studio is a lab and you don't have to um, show everything. That in the, there are things that you do for yourself and that you can develop, take time to just develop for it for till you feel like it's functioning in a way or speaking in a way that you feel uh, is is right, just you know, for you. I love that. Excellent. Okay, so now we're gonna do a couple of fun, fast questions. A couple of words, a short phrase, if we can. Uh, but we but we have some time. Okay, first, your favorite artist or one of your favorite artists. This is so mean. <laughs> so it could be of the to, moment. I know, I know. Um, how about I'll just give three authors. N.K. Jemison, amazing. Edward Shantika, Farmer of Bones, and Octavia Butler. Excellent, excellent. Any, um, anyone in the art world you want to mention? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I did mention Oliver Eliason. Yes. And Carrie James Marshall. And Teresita Fernandez. Oh my God. This is like, it's too limiting. That's all right. That's six. That's six. That's six okay, people. Okay. Your favorite tool in the studio. So I actually, it's funny because I have like a little show and tell. So I would have them next to me. I have a graveyard of these, the Isabel tiny paint, uh, paint brushes. So as you see, tiny water base. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so folks can see it. There's also my mall stick that I have to like cover with a paper towel because it just keeps getting something you lean on to like steady your hand as I make those thousands of little hairs with a little brush. Um, and for the when I get tired of that tiny meditative gesture, I can do the larger work with the palette knife. So three answers again. Excellent. Excellent. Um, one of the, you, you've already talked uh, about a lot of um, books that you've read, but maybe one of the most impactful books for you in now, earlier in your career, whenever. The Earth Seed series and Exogenesis series. I keep geeking out over those. They're so generative. Um, your favorite uh, pandemic binge? So many. <laughs> But also like things that I could do while I was um, painting. Um, one of the binges was reading the Obelisk Gate series by N.K. Jemison, and um, just reading it and then making and then being like, huh, she meant this when she was saying that. Or just having it uh, unfold so generously over time, the more you think about it. Mm -hmm. I just finished The Killing Moon and the that series by her. They're a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. See, that wasn't so difficult. That wasn't know, so stressful. Um, okay. So um, we have a, a queue building up. Um, um, oh, someone is asking me to put the favorites in the q and I'll try. I'll try. Or maybe um, one of the administrators can type in for me. So um, Katie Preston, one of our um, graduate students, uh, doctoral students in the English department, um, says, could you tell us about your definition or maybe just your sense of beauty or the beautiful? Uh, that's tricky because for me, part finding beauty had to, um, I had to allow myself to first engage with the object, um, to, I felt like I needed to open my understanding of beauty, um, especially because I was in that transition space between two, two different spaces where beautiful meant wildly opposing things, mm -hmm. um, especially as a child. Like now um, we have this like bodacious being that's very popular and people will modify themselves to fit within that. Um, but that maybe was true in the Caribbean, but wasn't true in the US. So I had to first disengage with either and then um, go almost into a sublime and like a sensate sublime hmm. and beauty through objects. So part of the engagement with that hair was like even looking at things like the Hirsute Magdalene or um, yeah, these things that 
were both beautiful and repelling at the same time. So You're great. saying all my favorite words, Fidele. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I write about abjection and the sublime is like an entry point for me. So I feel like when you're describing the beautiful, you're actually describing like the really viscous, repulsive things that, that pull us in anyway, right? Um, effectively and emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, uh, another one of our doctoral students in American studies um, says, I heard the word amalgamation in reference to your description of unrest and resistance and wondered if you could say more about the role of the amalgam within your practice conceptually and formally. Within unrest and resistance. Um, well, that we don't exist as much as we would like to think of ourselves as singular beings in the world, we're all in relation. Um, we exist in this constant navigation of the world around us. And the more open we can be to that, to the amalgam, the more um, we can see that, you know, we're not even this body, like we're not this concrete thing we think of, like this skin that we think of as a barrier is an interface with so many things around us. Um, and that's part of the amalgam with things minutely small and vastly large, knowing that they're all in continuation of each other. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, and this, you know, harkens back to your comments about the environment, to your comments about like the linkages of things and the ways that you're thinking about also your interventions, right, in archives and institutions. Um, okay, one of our uh, uh, alum, Kat Chavez, um, mucho, mucho amor, she sends first. Um, I'm incredibly interested in your expansion towards architecture and monumentality as a major form in your work. Having first witnessed your work on paper at Mula, Mola, M-O-L-A-A, -A, many years back, um, but, being, um, but being more recently mesmerized by your installation at the High Line and now very excited by the images of your forthcoming install at the ICA, I'm curious, how do you view world building in your work? With these architectures, I find simultaneously that you build new worlds and elucidate crumbling pasts on building. Can you share more about this? What are your hopes, imaginations as we build new worlds? Yeah, thanks for that great question, Kat. Um, I, as a painter, I was always jealous of this thing that sculpture is able to do, which is to shortcut our, um, per, our, our expectations of what this thing should perform as. So we uh, react physically and in very base ways, which maybe that's a wrong word to use, or this very like uh, quick human ways. Um, so fear, love, abject, these things are just quick before you start conceptualizing what that object should function as. So one of the reasons why I would paint large was to have that heraldic physical interaction with an object before you started engaging with these histories that might feel um, exclusive or opaque. Um, so to uh, activate that sense of generosity within the viewer um, or to shortcut the fear of being excluded from a narrative. Um, and so sculpture and these large installations just allowed me to do that at an even grander scale um, and to do the same thing I was hoping the paintings were doing um, in uh, even, even more expansive ways in sense of um, creating shelter, creating um, a meditative space um, and a very clear interaction with things like the Drexia myth, um, which is fantastic. Um, and, you know, a very, the very real kingdom of Haiti, Northern kingdom of Haiti. Um, I think we have, I'm sorry, go ahead. Where are no, no, go ahead. I was going to say, we have maybe time for one more question if anybody wants to hop onto the Q&A and type one more. But I am um, kind of continuing this question on architecture. I've noticed um, two different kinds of structures. One um, is the very loose, very billowy, right? Uh, where um, kind of installation where um, folks get to come in and kind of engage. Um, and then the others are the very um, angular, um, more structural uh, walls. Um, and, and I too saw the Highline one and there we actually couldn't engage, right? We couldn't Which kind was of go sad. inside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually this leads me to, to my question um, is for you, what is the ideal engagement, um, you know? 
I mean, for the spectator. For me, uh, there it's funny because one institution had these this sign that said like we welcome loving, respectful touches. So <laughs> this, if it were up to me, like the Berlin one, um, I want these, and even something like the book pages. I like when the viewer can actively engage with these histories, and in a way um, restructure them. So when you, the reason to have even the book pages exposed and unframed um, is so that the viewer can come in and their breath, their presence, their being seduced by the tiny little image on the page um, makes them do all the things that will break down this page over time, that will fox and age. And um, yeah, we can, well, the painting is just the honey to, to like get the real thing, which is for both of us to engage and destroy this history. Or oh, destroy it, girl. <laughs> I know I didn't. I wanted to avoid the word, but even the Berlin sculpture um, was an, uh, uh, a a mashup of the Sanssouci in Berlin and the Sanssouci in Haiti, and um, they're both World Heritage sites. So if it were up to me, it could have been tagged. I love seeing little kids climb on it. I love seeing that um, physical engagement that can uh, lend itself to then a more conceptual, you know durational experience of it totally i love that i love um because i don't think i've been allowed to get that close to the pages before really uh, yeah you know yeah. they have those lines at the gallery i know i know i know in here um, so good. Yeah. yeah but i do i do love that invitation from you um and you know it, it also continues to kind of play with the the limitations of the gallery space, right? The way that you play with them, with your gestural vo vocabulary, with your invitations, you you entice the viewer, and you're also kind of pushing back at the very institutions that that house you. Um, it looks like we have just thanks um, somebody. I did ask the question about dream work, um, and I think I think folks just want to hear. I you think talk I wasn't a little specific enough. Dreams. So that's the thing. I feel like um, my experience of the world is already very trippy. <laughs> like I'm very open to um, things revealing themselves. Um, so I let things speak in a way that, like I'm it's just always fighting that singular narrative. Um, and part of it is just being like, huh, this plant looks this way. Why is it named this way? It looks so beautiful. Why are the forms like, you know, it's like being seeing a dog breed you like and being like, how did you get to be this way? <laughs> You're so beautiful, but why? <laughs> and then like going down the rabbit hole of um, what made it be and then not just the trajectory of what created it to this moment, but why do I react the way I do to it? Um, and a lot of times it's nonsensical. It might be like it's embracing the things that um, might be considered silly, which then end up looking very dreamlike in the work um, because it's just merging two realities that we experience in a very sophisticated way with our senses, but um, that if you were to write down, it'd be like, that makes no sense. Like, why would, why but would also, also gives us, new sites to imagine right i think Absolutely. you know we're just about out of time that's a great point to end on the kind of dream-like possibilities of your work um Fidele, thank you so much uh, you. for sharing and thank you everyone for joining us um this evening and and for your questions and your time so bye everyone goodbye